Hello, everyone. This will just take a second to get us set up here. Hi, welcome again. And uh, any new folks, if you've been on vacation or something, hello. Uh, today is uh, the third lecture in the set part two of the Jefferson series. And uh, we're going to talk about questions from last week that I didn't know answers to off the top of my head. First, the Louisiana Purchase. Who were the senators that voted against it? it this was kind of interesting because uh, there were 15 states, consequently 30 uh, uh, senators, uh, two from each state. And uh, the vote is generally recorded as 24 to 6. But uh, every place I looked, there were seven senators who voted against it. So something's a bit screwy. At any rate, uh, both of the senators, Olcott and Plumer from New Hampshire voted, were opposed to it. Wells and White of Delaware voted in opposition. Uh, Hill House and Tracy of Connecticut and Pickering of Massachusetts. Now these are all Northern states. Uh, Delaware was the only one of the four states here that voted against it. Uh, that had slaves or allowed slavery, but it was a border state, never seceded, et cetera. Uh, it attempted to get rid of slavery on four occasions, but the bills always failed. So this starts to look like uh, something the North, uh, or uh, you know, at least seven senators in the North were opposed to. And the reason may have been the extension of slavery. Here are the four states. Let's start at the top at this arrow. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, and Delaware. Now, uh, here's the Mississippi River. Lots of trade could have been had along the Mississippi River. Uh, at that time, at least, with uh, Native American groups. Uh, trade in this area and opening this up to uh, other nations for trade would seriously affect the port cities of New England, where uh, most of the trade was leaving from at that time. So this may have been an economic issue, uh, primarily for these uh, Northwestern uh, New England states. Uh, farmers out West could now use the Mississippi River so food items would stop coming out through the Eastern ports, uh, or at least a great many of them might. So uh, reduction in business. Also, uh, what's gonna happen with slavery in this new territory could have been an issue. So economics, slavery. Uh, tax on alcohol uh, that caused the Whiskey Rebellion. What was that tax? Uh, it varied based on how much production you gave out. Small producers were charged 18 cents a gallon. Half of that for middle group uh, producers and just a third of that for large producers, six cents a gallon. All these payments had to be made to the federal government and they had to be made in cash. Now, I could not find uh, any references to what, how much is a small producer, how much is a large producer, but you can certainly see there was lots of favoritism in this uh, liquor tax to larger producers. Uh, before the Civil War, just as another point of interest, even though we're talking about 1801 to 1809 and the Jefferson presidency, interesting thing is uh, uh, during the, uh, just before the Civil War started, the tax was 20 cents a gallon on all manufacturers, no matter what uh, size of production you put out. So that had risen 
from those uh, previous amounts I'd explained. During the Civil War, the tax on a bottle of liquor was raised to $2 a gallon. The reason for that is there was no income tax yet. It was unconstitutional. It required a constitutional amendment to start income tax. Uh, and, uh, you know, that wouldn't happen for another 50 years after the Civil War was over. So the federal government needed taxes for the war. Consequently, this gigantic raise on uh, $2 per gallon uh, during the Civil War on alcohol. Meriwether Lewis, what were the charges against him when he was governor of Louisiana Territory? Charges were improper use of government funds, so he was given money by the federal government to aid in the management of Louisiana Territory, and he was spending it incorrectly or inappropriately. Uh, he profited from the return of a Mandan chief to his tribal group, so apparently the United States had held a Mandan chief and uh, the Mandans wanted the chief back. And one of the charges is uh, uh, that Lewis, uh, it sounds like he must have uh, required a, a price. You know, we'll give him back to you for this much money. And, and he profited from that. Also, he was heavily in debt and a lot of creditors were calling in his loans. So, uh, he was debt-ridden, so uh, use of government funds, uh, profits from the return of a captured chieftain, and uh, heavy debts. Now, this man, Frederick Bates, is the man who leveled the charges, and he never liked Lewis. He was a major enemy of Lewis's. So, or the, or the, the, I mean, that casts a lot of doubt on these charges also, but uh, the charges were important enough to cause uh, Washington, D.C. to recall Lewis, come back and answer some questions. Who wrote the Lewis and Clark journals? There were six people that wrote those journals, Lewis and Clark, were the top ones. They were captains in the military. And uh, I see I misspelled Clark's name, Clack, <laughs> up there at the top. Got it right down here, though. Uh, I used to mis deliberately misspell stuff. And I'd tell students, if you see anything that's out of line, I'll give you five extra points. So. So I get the five extra points for finally noticing that. Anyhow, there was help from four other people. They were all sergeants and they aided in the writing of the Lewis and Clark journals. Charles Floyd, Patrick Gass, John Ordway, and Nathaniel Pryor. So a total of six people involved in the writing of these journals. And again, from last week, you can buy the journals in in print, in typed, you know, face, uh, and you get them on Amazon. Lewis and Clark expedition now, uh, the goal not considered. This is, we're done with the questions from last week. Uh, this is now uh, a pickup on the lecture again, and we're gonna finish up the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, which, was 1803 to 1806. There was a goal that Lewis and Clark never talked about. Jefferson never mentioned. They didn't just didn't think it was, uh, are there any people out there in the Louisiana territory? Lewis and Clark recorded over 70 tribal groups that they had contacted. Uh, they uh, There were five major items that they talked about within these groups. Uh, natives were not surprised at all by the white men on the tour, but uh, there was a, uh, they, there'd been fur trappers had come into this area, uh, primarily from France, 
a uh, lot of places in Minnesota have Catholic churches, which these fur traders, once settlers followed them, they were Catholics. And uh, there were many things among the fur trading population and their contacts with Native Americans that, uh, uh, you know, I want to hunt on your territory, trap furs, etc. They might charge the fur traders something. And uh, uh, so they had had contact with white men, usually individuals. Frequently, these French fur traders would intermarry with uh, Native women. Uh, when uh, uh, large populations of Europeans came into North Dakota, they found blue-eyed Mandan Indians, uh, indicating uh, uh, that some people from Northern Europe, at least, uh, certainly were in the area, at least that's the assumption. So maybe Vikings were in there, maybe much earlier than French fur traders. Second, natives were amazed by Clark's black slave York. They had never seen a black person and that person of African ancestry. Uh, there's a statue to York who went on this expedition with Clark in Louisville, Kentucky. There's a picture of it on the right. Uh, many native groups demanded uh, payment to cross their land or ford their rivers or, uh, you know, you want to use this river, okay, you need to pay us something. And uh, of course, coins and money were not anything that Native Americans used at this time. Uh, so it, had, it was goods. Lewis and Clark had brought lots of goods along with them on this trip, uh, uh, figuring they would uh, might need those for themselves. And fortunately, they had plenty of it. They could get game and other foods uh, as they traveled uh, through the area. So they were able to give up some of these supplies uh, to native groups who then allowed them to pass through their area. Uh, they also recorded lots of warfare among these tribal groups, uh, lots of disputes over territory uh, and, uh, you know, who could hunt where, for instance, things like that. A fourth item, life was very rough for Native Americans, so uh, it was difficult. Uh, food was often uh, in short supply. Winters would come on early and they hadn't migrated yet for those who were nomadic groups, uh, less settled, non-agricultural groups. Uh, and uh, uh, deaths were earlier than in Europe where supplies, especially food, were regular. And fifth, the treatment of Native uh, American, varied Native Americans. Now, this is simply a report, no negative intentions or, uh, you know, involved in these comments that I'm about to make. They're simply observations that were made by the expedition. Uh, men had multiple wives among uh, many of the Native uh, groups. So they, they practiced uh, multiple wives uh, and uh, they could marry their sisters. Now this was, uh, there's three major groups uh, throughout history, uh, Native Americans, Egyptians, and Hawaiians, where the nobility would marry their sisters, uh, especially the pharaohs in Egypt and the kings in Hawaii or the queens in Hawaii would marry their brothers. And this was uh, this was recorded by Lewis and Clark among tribal groups uh, that they contacted. Uh, chastity was not held in a high regard for Native women. Uh, a lot of this is the result of uh, Native groups being nomadic, not settled. Nomadic peoples uh, never made the um, association between sexual activity and pregnancy. 
They thought pregnancy, this life giving, was some special uh, characteristic that women had. It wasn't until people became settled and uh, they would start planting uh, crops. They'd stay in one area. They could eat the crops they'd planted and preserve them over the winter. But most importantly for uh, childbearing was they also husband animals. So they would take a group of sheep and put, uh, put all the males in one uh, pen and all the females in another. And they noticed the females never got pregnant until a male was introduced. This empowered males. This is what civilized society did, made the connection between sex and pregnancy. So among nomadic peoples, pregnancy was uh, a very special trait that made women uh, very special uh, individuals. Uh, from the Middle East and up into uh, Europe, uh, we see figures from nomadic peoples of pregnant women, enlarged breasts, large stomachs. This was something that was uh, considered uh, very important because women had this ability. Uh, third, uh, daughters, uh, Lewis and Clark report, uh, daughters were frequently sold to other tribal members uh, for food and goods. Uh, some areas held women in very high regard due to the fact that they gave birth. Uh, women leaders were um, occasionally seen um, and uh, women had special clothing, special face paint, etc. Uh, presidency uh, continues, uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. There have been some memorial stamps. Here's the 150th anniversary, which was 1954, 1804 to 1954. Here's a three cent stamp from that uh, year. Uh, the 200th anniversary, which was in 2004, here's a 37 cent stamp. They'd been three cents in 54. Now it's 50 years later, they're 37 cents. Uh, so that's a 12-fold increase. Here's another postage stamp from the 200th anniversary of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Again, a 37 cent stamp from 2004 with uh, images of Lewis on the left here and Clark. Uh, so 1954, sending a letter costs three cents. Uh, in 2022, it was 63 cents. That's a 21-fold increase. On January 21st, just a few days ago, the price of a stamp went up to 68 cents. That's 22.67-fold increase since 1954, 22-fold increase. But... The Pony Express in 1859, a letter cost five dollars, so the price of postage has really declined, declined dramatically from 1859 anyway. Uh, five dollars today, sixty-six cents. That's a decrease of seventy-six percent. Uh, little known expeditions. Lewis and Clark, everybody's heard of. It's taught in schools. But Jefferson sent out three other expeditions. And we're going to take a look at those. Uh, the Ochito Expedition, 1804 and 5, same time as the uh, Lewis and Clark Expedition. We'll also talk about the Red River Expedition from the same exact years as Lewis and Clark and the Rocky Mountain Expedition, again, same years as the Lewis and Clark Expedition into Louisiana Territory. None of these three expeditions has been named for the uh, uh, people that led it. 
there is one that's sometimes referred to by name, but not commonly. Uh, so the Lewis and Clark expedition is named for its leaders. The three expeditions we're going to talk about are named for the areas they explored. So the Ochito River. Uh, William Dunbar on your uh, left and George Hunter on your right were the leaders of this expedition. And it included a, the uh, Ochito River, which begins on the western border of Arkansas, uh, flows southward through central Arkansas and into northern Louisiana. And down in the lower central portion of Louisiana, it drains in to the Mississippi River. <clears throat> uh, it was a small area expedition, uh, nothing as large as uh, Lewis and Clark's Louisiana expedition. It involved 19 people. There were 45 for Lewis and Clark. So this is... Uh, you know, two and a half times smaller in number. This was the first exclusively scientific expedition in United States history. Lewis and Clark had lots of purposes. One of them was to look at some science stuff. But uh, this uh, Ochito River was interested only in recording scientific information. Six accomplishments on the Ochito expedition. They spent four weeks at a hot springs and a salt springs, and uh, natives used them to treat ailments. Uh, they were seen as a place where sick people could go, although people relaxed in them also. Uh, such springs existed in Europe, and um, uh, European people were, the Europeans here that were going along the Ochito River were familiar with this, they spent four weeks at, uh, at the hot springs that they found just to relax, et cetera. Uh, I have uh, gone into the Canadian hot springs in the Rocky Mountains, uh, 30 miles north of Jasper twice, uh, and very interesting uh, stuff. Uh, cabins all around there that you can rent, and then you go sit. They transfer the water into pools so you don't sit in a natural setting at Miette Hot Springs in Canada. Water temperature was measured at 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and they were aghast that when looking under a microscope, they saw organisms who could live at such temperatures. First time organisms were discovered living at those temperatures was on this Ochito River expedition. No source was discovered for the springs. They couldn't figure out where they were coming to, where they were coming from, why they were hot. Uh, we now know they come from underground and they're heated by the hotter earth underground. The water's heated in that way. They observed along the way uh, several types of animals, in particular uh, buffalo, deer, raccoons, and swans raccoons and swans pictured here. Lots of limestone deposits. Now this was very important because limestone was used in building. So you get out into this area uh, with new immigrants, uh, new white folks from Europe, and they would have some building materials. Also, it snowed on this expedition and it was in Southern states. This was very rare in Arkansas and Louisiana, but they recorded that, hey, it snows here. Uh, they also were hoping to be part of a larger expedition, but didn't win out. Lewis and Clark got that job. Again, William Dunbar and George Hunter were the <clears throat> uh, expedition leaders for the Ochito River expedition. Second expedition that we're going to talk about that occurred in 1806 is the Red River Expedition. Thomas Freeman was on the uh, expedition. He was a surveyor, so he could measure the land, help establish borders. There is no surviving image 
of Thomas Freeman. Also in command on this expedition was Peter Custis, who was pictured here in this uh, drawing. There were 21 men on the Red River expedition. And uh, uh, their purpose, they uh, one of the purposes was find the origin of the Red River. Where does it start? And they never did get that uh, figured out. But here you can see it starts just over the border in New Mexico and runs all the way down to the Mississippi River here. But let's take a look at this. It starts in New Mexico. See number one on the map with the arrow. Number two on the map is the Texas Panhandle. Red River runs across the Texas Panhandle. Then number three, the Red River forms the border between Texas and Oklahoma. Number four, it uh, cuts across the southwest corner of Arkansas there, just barely in Arkansas, takes a, <clears throat> takes a sharp turn heading southward. <clears throat> and that's uh, area number five then where it cuts across uh, the state of Louisiana uh, well, going south and east and empties in to the Mississippi River. 750 miles in length, that's uh, 1,207 kilometers. Uh, there's a, a book about this uh, by Thomas Freeman. He was one of the leaders of the expedition, the one we didn't have a picture of. Now, if you look on here, this is not the author, Dan Flores. He helped edit their uh, man, their uh, writings, and he wrote the introduction and epilogue to this book. But the book is by Thomas Freeman, <clears throat> and it's available online if you're interested in this stuff, further interested. Three goals of the Red River Expedition. First one was... Uh, you know, everybody hoped the Red River started uh, someplace uh, near Santa Fe because that would make it a great trade route to this very large Mexican city or Spanish city that had been established uh, there. And you can see there's Santa Fe, but uh, it didn't uh, it didn't make it to Santa Fe that far, missed by many many miles. Would have really aided trade. Second thing was along the river, make contact with Native American groups and uh, uh, set up trade agreements with them. Uh, and here's, uh, here's a guy selling rifles. Now, selling rifles to Native Americans eventually became something that was illegal <clears throat> to do. <clears throat> uh, find the South and Southwest borders of the Louisiana Territory. Uh, they wanted to establish this Louisiana Territory line very well. That's why a surveyor was sent on this expedition. And you can see here's the Red River and it, it, it basically is the, uh, or here's the border, I'm sorry, here's the border of uh, the Louisiana Territory. Red River runs north of that. Um, so, uh, you know, in order to prevent conflicts over the border later, let's get it established. That was the third of three goals for this group. Uh, diplomatic issues arose. Freeman was a surveyor. Custis was a naturalist. Made it look like a scientific expedition, not a military one. That was done on purpose due to fears that uh, uh, the Spanish might get concerned if there were military along. Uh, and it wouldn't be threatening, uh, not just to the Spanish, but the French were interested in this area also, as was Britain. Well, 21 of the 24 people on the expedition were military people, however. So the whole uh, announcement that this is a scientific expedition was really total BS. Congress approved funding for the expedition. Spain became very concerned about it. 
these Spanish concerns uh, got the two leaders to say, hey, we need more people. 21 isn't enough. So the size of this group was increased to 45 people. Again, uh, uh, virtually all of them uh, armed military people to protect the surveyor and the naturalist who were along. Uh, they got near a New Boston, Texas on the Red River and they started hearing uh, gunshot. And it was Spanish soldiers who had observed them. And the Spanish contacted them and said, you gotta, your expedition has to turn back. The expedition saw that they were incredibly outnumbered, had no choice, so they stopped the expedition. Here is New Boston at this yellow dot. So you can see these areas, basically one, two, and three on my scale. Uh, this is where the expedition came to a halt. Uh, the river was 750 miles long. They covered 600 miles of it. Consequently, 80% uh, of the river got covered. So that was nice. I mean, it was a major, major chunk uh, of the river. Why is it called the Red River? Look at it. It's red in nature. Why? How does it get red? That's because there's lots of iron around the river and uh, the rust of the iron rock uh, is red in color and uh, dissolves in the water. Hence, it's called the Red River and it's red in color. Uh, consequences of this expedition and accomplishments. Uh, Custis was the naturalist. Uh, set a, he set a standard for how to research uh, areas where there were wildflowers growing <clears throat> and how to identify them. Future expeditions in the United States used these methods and standards that were developed by Custis. Uh, the whole area was described as wide open, flat land, a uh, great place for large numbers of people. Bring the U.S. citizens in here. Hey, did you notice anything in that photo? There were windmills. There was a contrail, trees. This means it's a pretty modern photo. There it is. There's the trees. Here's the windmills. Here's the contrail. Uh, positive relations with Native Americans were established. Uh, so that was very good. You're going to see more white folks coming in here. We want to uh, do this and that and the other thing, and we'll see to it you're rewarded. Uh, due to the confrontation with the Spanish, however, uh, the research from this expedition was hidden for many years uh, because uh, there were negative comments made by the expedition in the writings about the Spanish. So, uh, especially due to the confrontation that occurred 600 miles into this expedition. Consequently, we we'll keep it top secret. Uh, Spanish uh, ended up opening the area to trade Headwaters of the Red River were not discovered till 1852. Uh, this is 46 years after this expedition occurred, and they were far from Santa Fe. So trade with Santa Fe by river uh, was negated uh, in the early 1850s. A uh, third expedition we're going to talk about is the Rocky Mountain Expedition, uh, sometimes called the Pike expedition, but not frequently. <clears throat> so these three expeditions are named for places. This Rocky Mountain expedition was 1806 to 07. Uh, but again, we have a famous leader such as Lewis and Clark, who most Americans have heard of. They have also heard of Zebulon Pike of Pike's Peak fame. Uh, the Rocky Mountain expedition was the last expedition into this Louisiana territory. And uh, you can see, here's Pike's Peak. 
and here's a route followed. They got down into Mexico. They started in St. Louis, came out this way, headed back that way. But there was trouble. Uh, there's areas that they were going to explore, and we're going to talk about that before we get to the trouble. Uh, the Red River of the South, the Western Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountains. Here's the Western Great Plains exploration area. Here's the Rocky Mountain portion. Here's the source of the Red River. They didn't find it. So they found rivers that could be used for transportation. That's how people got around in the early 1800s. There weren't very many roads and Pike's Peak was discovered. The native name for it was Tava Kovi, or which means Sun Mountain. And uh, there's a picture of Pike's Peak. <clears throat> Another picture, and of course, uh, the whole area here is uh, set up for tourists. So there's lots of great tourist attractions all throughout the Rocky Mountain area. Pikes Peak was 14,000 feet high. Pike said, I want to climb that. I'll take a group of a few people with me. By the time they got near the top, the snow was so deep, they could not get to the top. The reason Pike wanted to get to the top was to look around and see what else was in the area. Wanted a high place where he could take a view of things. Uh, now, <clears throat> once they leave Pike's Peak and head south through the Rockies, do more research and looking around, they stumbled into Mexico. This is accidental. This is, uh, they're no longer in uh, uh, Louisiana territory. They're in Spanish territory, and they built a fort there <clears throat> to winter over in, and they were discovered there. And all the troops, including Pike, of course, were arrested by the Spanish, and uh, the assumption was, you're down here in Mexico, you're looking for forts we've got built, you're looking for how many troops we've got in this area, and you're looking for civilian populations and cities or villages that have grown up in this area, and you're going to report that to United States political officials. So they were held for about four months in captivity from uh, February to June of 1807, and uh, finally were released, but uh, not without a Spanish ex escort. And the Spanish said, you're going back uh, deep into the United States here. Uh, they marched them all the way to the Louisiana border along this arrow line here. So they didn't get to do much work on that uh, southern return to the Mississippi River right here. Here's them back up to St. Louis. <clears throat> Zebulon Pike in Minnesota, we're going to make a Minnesota connection here that uh, <clears throat> occurred at the same time Jefferson was president. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> in 1805, Pike signed a treaty with Native Americans that ceded 100,000 acres of their territory that eventually became the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. So here's a map of Hennepin and uh, uh, Ramsey County and portions surrounding or what became Hennepin and Ramsey counties and greater areas there. So Pike got, got this land from the Native Americans. Uh, it included land where Fort Snelling is uh, built, uh, the old Fort Snelling, the oldest one. Actually, it includes land where uh, this is in the 1820s. This fort got built, started in 1806 and completed later. Uh, then there's an 1880 fort and then a modern fort from the 1940s and 50s. And uh, it was uh, the reason for this Pike Island where it picked up the name of Pike. Uh, it was just a very important area militarily because 
the Mississippi River and the Minnesota River come together here. So you could see lots of traffic, make sure it wasn't military in nature uh, or that it wasn't Native American, et cetera. Here's, a, here's Pike Island. This is the pointed end of a Pike Island. A uh, uh, path has been cleared so you could walk down to the uh, river area there. And uh, here's that point again. And the beach uh, has been created there so you can dock ships and sit there, picnic, et cetera. <clears throat> this is the Minnesota River. <clears throat> this is the Mississippi River. Minnesota River and the Mississippi River come together here and they're called the Muddy, muddy Mississippi or I'm sorry, the muddy Minnesota and the mighty Mississippi, and it's where they come together. And you can see why the Minnesota River is called muddy. It is indeed uh, brown in color compared to the Mississippi River in both of these uh, images. Uh, uh, Pike told Congress that uh, this is a huge area of land. It's an excellent chunk of land worth about $200,000. Uh, and here's a coin uh, from 1805, uh, the time when this treaty was being signed here in Minnesota. Uh, of course, Indians coins were worthless to them. They wanted to be paid in goods. Now, Congress then voted to pay the natives $2,000 worth of goods. That's 1% of Pike's recommendation uh, to Congress uh, about what the true value of the land was. <clears throat> uh, the Native Americans called it Badote uh, Island, uh, and it was sacred to Native Americans. Uh, the United States chose to name it Pike Island. It bears that name to this day. And here you can see, here's historic Fort Snelling that was started to be built uh, at the time of, um, after Pike left. <clears throat> and uh, uh, here's Mendota, city of Mendota. Anyhow, it's quite a spectacular spot. Here's where the Mississippi River and the Minnesota Rivers come together. Uh, this is me before I had cataract surgery, which, uh, requires, I, I only need glasses for about four feet out now for the last year and a half, but I grew up near this place. It's also near Minnehaha Falls. And I frequently played at this historic fort before it was restored. It was a shambles uh, kind of, except for one building. Uh, it's now been renovated and is a state uh, historic area. This roundhouse was a commercial establishment when I was a kid. There was a woman in there on the, on the first floor who took over this building and she ran a beauty salon. You know, she was a cosmetologist, a hairstylist. And, and this whole area uh, has been restored. This is the modern fort now that, I don't know, I'd say, 40 years ago or more, 50 maybe, is when it was restored. It's wonderful in the summer. You go in there, they got troops march marching. There are women fixing meals. Uh, they're all in dress from the period. And Jefferson's attitude toward Native Americans. Uh, natives, uh, were a civilized people, according to Jefferson. They were very much the equal of Europeans and Americans uh, who had emigrated here from Europe. Uh, they can be our friends, intelligent people. Uh, they would assimilate well with us. We just need to get them to adapt to an agricultural life. Some were agriculturally based. Others were still nomadic. He said, that's evidence that they can all be uh, civilized. With civil, that word means city. 
So it means they have cities and they live someplace permanently. They're not nomadic. Uh, and that's what civilization, uh, that, that's the origin of that word, it means people are settled living in cities. Uh, so they'll assimilate well with us. In other words, uh, they'll be just like us white folks. After the American Revolution, uh, Jefferson wanted some Native groups removed. Now, the reason for that was because they'd sided with the British during the American Revolution. So those groups that uh, wanted uh, the new settled Americans out of here, those Native groups, we want to be rid of them. They're our enemy. Uh, but the whole thing backfired, and the reason was it just tightened relations between many Native American groups and the British. Because the, these uh, Native American groups went, well, these people that have come from Europe and settled here are taken over our land and opposed to us. Uh, Georgia Natives. Uh, uh, in order to own land in Georgia, Natives said the you need to give us military support. So Native American military groups would support the U.S. should the uh, likelihood ever become necessary for that. And Georgia was populated with lots of Native Americans who were settled peoples, civilized in that sense, and living in cities. And uh, one of the big leaders of Georgia Native Americans is an ancestor of the country western singer Johnny Cash. Now, when I typed in Georgia for a map, this is what I got: Georgia, which is part of uh, uh, was part of Russia, and uh, it was interesting because uh, uh, my wife had, knew a woman, and we were invited to. Uh, her grandfather's house for a party, and the grandfather was there. And he had a framed letter from Nikita Khrushchev. And I said, what's this all about? And he said, my parents came here from Georgia uh, when I was in sixth grade. And from first through sixth grade, I went to school with Nikita Khrushchev. So I wrote him a letter, and he wrote back to me. Uh, Jefferson's main purpose here was to make peace with uh, Native Americans. He, he thought they would be uh, great people to be allied with. African slaves, none of this was true. Uh, Jefferson thought uh, people coming out of Africa were inferior to whites and to Native Americans. And... Uh, Lots of people excuse this. They say, well, it was a sign of the times. Of course, Jefferson believed that. Everybody believed in slaves. Now, that's just simply not true. Lots of people were opposed to slavery. Uh, people in the northern colonies were opposed to it. People in the, once they became states, they spoke to Jefferson about it. Jefferson had spent time as a diplomat uh, with lots of contact with British and French people who had abolished slavery, they spoke to him about it. Uh, there was uh, lots of attitudes being thrown at Jefferson uh, during this entire period that were very that were anti-slavery in nature. So the whole notion that this was the idea of the times uh, really isn't true. Uh, so Jefferson was. Uh, literally bombarded with arguments against slavery. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about uh, uh, issues of uh, the second term that Jefferson served. This would have been uh, 1805 to 1809. Uh, Britain and France were at war. Uh, now, what happened was the French Revolution started in 1792. Uh, here you got uh, uh, the uh, common people in France rising up against their uh, nobility and their king, arresting the king and queen, having them uh, beheaded, 
uh, by a guillotine. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, should the U.S. support Britain uh, or should they support France and its revolution? France had done a great deal for us during the American Revolution. They had brought in uh, military officers, ships that blockaded our ports so the British couldn't get into them. Uh, that actually, those, those ship blockades really won the American Revolution, especially at Yorktown, where the British ended up surrendering. Uh, at any rate, uh, hey, if your enemy is uh, fighting amongst themselves, as the French were, you invade them. Consequently, the British invaded. That brought on British and French wars at the same time the French Revolution was occurring. We'd just we'd had this war with Britain again. France had supported us. Big debate was uh, who should we support in this French and British war? Well, it seems kind of simple, doesn't it? Except Britain was the world trade giant, and we were dependent on Britain for trade. Uh, here you can see they would go to Africa and they'd come to the United States also with textiles with brandy, alcohol, and firearms. They would then bring slaves into South America, <clears throat> the Gulf and Caribbean area, Central America, and, uh, and into the United States also. And then they would take back sugar, coffee, and tobacco, and, uh, other, and drop off other goods that the United States needed, clothing in particular. So, France helped us in the American Revolution. Great deal of support. But Britain had the goods. And they were still transporting those goods during the war. France didn't have a lot of those goods that we could use. Once the revolution was over, uh, Napoleon became the new king of France. And uh, most people in the United States didn't like Napoleon. He was conquering all of Europe. He, he had conquered North Africa. And, uh, and then he starts off into Russia. Uh, you know, that comes later than Jefferson's uh, term in office. But fact is, people didn't like somebody doing all these conquests. People in the United States didn't. Let's talk about the Embargo Act of 1807. It's about trade. What does embargo mean? You stop trade with other countries. This is a big issue. France, Britain, etc. What do we do? Britain's at war with France. France was our ally. Uh, probably Britain is the only place we should put this embargo into effect, they'd, uh, uh, you know, because uh, th they would be a better trade partner. And we didn't like Napoleon, so what are we going to do? Well, uh, the British, uh, an argument against them was they would pull up with a warship to a United States privately owned ship carrying goods that were being traded with European countries and they would remove, they would kidnap or capture sailors off of those privately held U.S. commercial ships because they needed more men on their military vessel. Here's an example of that. Uh, it was called impressment. Uh, we're going we're gonna to impress your soldiers into the British Navy because we need more men on our ship. Somebody fell overboard or three guys got sick and died, whatever the reason might be. So that's another reason to cut off trade with Britain. They're kidnapping our sailors on privately owned ships. What are the provisions of this embargo act that stopped trade? All U.S. ships that are privately owned were not allowed to trade with any nation. So we didn't just cut off Britain or France. We cut off 
all nations, no more trade with anybody. Uh, that'll stop a lot of problems. And we don't have to decide France or Britain either. No U.S. Ship, ships can uh, visit any foreign ports. That also stops trade. However, U.S. warships can trade with these countries, but only to gain supplies that they need to maintain themselves. We didn't have much of a Navy at the time. So anytime our naval ships, which are government owned, are in international waters and they need supplies, it's okay for them to stop and get uh, fresh water, food, rum, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, but no, no other vessels can uh, do any trading with any nation worldwide. Uh, note this map here. It's not centered on the United States. Interesting how you can make a map and how the making of the map can influence what you're doing or thinking about. Look here. This is a map we're used to in the United States. Cuts off, cuts off Asia here. And then you got the other half of Asia over here. Whereas this map shows us all the continents intact. Interesting thing. Is it a bias? A lot of people say so. Uh, fourth item. President can allow any ship to trade. So you got some ship. Okay, well, this is an emergency and we need this and such. So the president can say to private industry, take your ship over there. They'll know you're coming and uh, uh, you know, pick up some goods and then come on back. <clears throat> <clears throat> All foreign ships are free to leave U.S. ports. At the time this Embargo Act was passed, lots of uh, ships uh, were sitting in U.S. harbors. What are we going to do with them? We're going to capture them, tell them they have to stay here. No, the Embargo Act said you're free to leave. So the Embargo Act, negative effects. Well, it was a near total failure. Seven negative effects we're going to look at. <clears throat> there was uh, no improvement in the power of the United States to negotiate with any other countries. That was one thing we kind of hoped for. We put up an embargo. These countries will say, well, we still want to trade with you. So what's the deal? You know, let's talk about it. Didn't happen. Second, uh, the weakness of the United States to fend for itself became clear. Uh, we became unable to protect uh, ships on ocean waters. We couldn't protect their crews. Uh, but, you know, once the law was passed, these ships had to get back to the United States. They were still being um, pulled over by British ships. There was still trouble. U.S. economy was damaged. Those port cities in New England in particular now had no traffic. Nobody was trading with us. The industrial areas of the United States, which were also along the East Coast, could no longer export their goods. So they could make goods and sell them within the United States, but they were making more than they could sell within the United States. They would send those to Europe. Now they can't do that. Agricultural products uh, were not sold internationally. Uh, you could barely make, uh, I mean, a single farmer could barely feed his own family, let alone sell much of the product. Uh, some of it was sold, had to be moved into cities. But even <clears throat> in cities at this time, people had gardens. So, U.S. economy was damaged. Let's get around the law. Uh, how do we get around the law? Well, we go out through Canada. 
And uh, that involved uh, pack animals, uh, or, you know, you could ship along internal rivers or lakes uh, up into Canadian ports and then get the stuff out that way and you're really <clears throat> exiting from a Canadian port. That's smuggling. So smuggling, individuals did it, big businesses did it, as privately owned uh, shipping companies that uh, whose ships were being attacked by Britain. These U.S. privately owned companies were uh, now uh, out of business. So the U.S. economy is damaged. Smuggling is the result. Uh, the gross domestic product fell by 5%. Doesn't sound like much, but that's a big deal to lose 5%. Um, you're making $100,000. Next year, you're making 95000 Political tensions rose in the United States over this act. Uh, there were protests, especially in the port cities in New England, along the English coast there, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, uh, places like that. Uh, lots of protests. Uh, the ports had shut down. Uh, people were out of work. Etc. Uh, Britain was the world economic leader. Did the embargo? What did the embargo do to them? Nothing. They could afford to lose a, a small little country like the United States. Uh, heck with it. I mean, uh, they owned land all around the world, uh, and they traded with those lands, and uh, that just—I mean, it was a smidgen of harm, if any. <clears throat> Uh, so British businesses, uh, you know, they looked at it as the United States is our competitor. Uh, so this is better for us. All the stuff the United States used to trade with European countries, we can now pick up that loss to these European countries because the U.S. isn't trading with any of them. So that's a better deal for Britain. Uh, Britain began to look to South America for trade. It became a huge uh, trade market for them, uh, greater trade than they'd ever had <clears throat> with North America and the British subjects who had landed there in the colonies and then fought a war to gain their independence. But uh, look here, Falkland Islands down here, they were picked up by Britain. To this day, they are still a part of Britain. There was a war in 72. Now, I guess I better take that back. At any rate, uh, up into the 1970s, at least, uh, Falkland Islands. I'll look it up for next week. I think they, uh, I think they're still under the control of the British. Argentina fought a war with them, but What's interesting is here for several hundred years then, there's uh, ownership, part of the British Empire is in South America. Uh, support for the Democratic Party went down. Jefferson was a Democrat. Support for Jefferson also declined dramatically. Uh, during the off-year elections for Congress, the Federalist Party gained lots of seats, gained control. Uh, local elections uh, were affected by foreign policy. Uh, so here you got this embargo act and uh, people are voting uh, based on foreign policy. Often it's other issues. <clears throat> this embargo act became the cause, a uh, major cause of the War of 1812, uh, which was between Britain and America. Uh, it said the American Revolution is when uh, the colonies won uh, political independence from England. The War of 1812 is when the, new, when the United States then 
won economic independence from Great Britain. So the American Revolution was a political war. The War of 1812 was an economic one. <coughs> Positive effects of the Embargo Act. Uh, New England mills had to start making a lot more cloth. A lot of cloth was made in Britain, made into clothing, and brought into the United States and traded here. And they were making it cheaper than it could be made in the United States. Now, all of a sudden, Britain can't bring any of that in. That adds a great deal of support to these uh, New England uh, mills that uh, made uh, uh, material that, and that was then made into uh, clothing. So business increased for United States millers. Industrial employment in the United States increased. So industries that were, <clears throat> you know, uh, making items out of copper or iron, things like that, their businesses increased. Soap making increased within the United States. <clears throat> it had been imported from other countries largely. Now, what you need to make soap is wood ash. Everybody was heating their homes with wood. You would save that ash and you could sell it. Uh, and the reason that the ash was important is because extracted from it would be lye. And lye, uh, this lye was used in the making of soap. So this became a big deal all of a sudden too and a very positive thing for the United States. All of a sudden, we had to make our own soap. So it was a growth in that industry. Uh, also, a lot of ash was smuggled in from Canada. Here on the map, this Lake Champlain, it's the border between Vermont and the state of New York. And it was a big highway for boats uh, coming out of Canada. You can see part of it goes up into Canada. So a lot of ash could be smuggled in too from Canada or brought in from Canada along uh, Lake Champlain. The smuggling along this lake doubled in size. Animals were also smuggled in from Canada. Uh, they were food. They now became food and pack animals who would bring in supplies that the U.S. could no longer trade with other uh, people, and uh, that was that was nice. <laughs> the uh, border was not patrolled. Uh, you know, ships patrolled along the port cities of the United States, but the border area on land would take a tremendous amount of uh, personnel uh, along this area. So trade with Canada rose by two thirds. You know, if, if it had been at say, uh, just a number of 100, it went up to 167. So uh, many people in the US sold their boats. They got a good chunk of money for that. And then they got involved in the smuggling industry, which was a land route uh, and made even more money as a result of this embargo act. So it was kind of a positive effect for small businessmen. The repeal of the embargo act. Um, 16 months after its passage, it was repealed like a mandarin orange. Uh, Presidency, Macon's Bill Number 2, 1807. Let's take a look at that. Here's Nathaniel Macon. He introduced the bill, and it reopened trade with Britain and France, both. Uh, the, these were the two countries that were, that were at war, and this would help return things to normal after that embargo act fiasco of nearly a year and a half. The French immediately resumed trade with the United States. Um, the Chesapeake, uh, excuse me, 
<clears throat> Excuse me, I got it. Well, thanks. Got a little clock over here so I can keep track of the time. I'm having some trouble with it. Anyhow, the uh, um, Chesapeake uh, Leopard Affair of 1807. These are uh, ship names. Chesapeake was a U.S. Uh, naval ship, and the Leopard was a British uh, naval ship. And uh, this was where uh, the British Navy said, we're going to impress some of your soldiers off of that ship. Uh, so there was a kidnapping. Uh, the incident led to diplomacy about impressment. Uh, James Monroe, future president, and Charles Pickney, a founding father. A treaty is named for both of them. And uh, basically what this treaty said is you have to stop impressing sailors off of uh, U.S. Uh, government and U.S. private ships, although private ships were the main victims here. Uh, during the negotiations, <clears throat> the British agents were very standoffish. This uh, uh, this really riled Jefferson. He just hated that uh, these people were acting so superior, noses in the air. And uh, when the treaty was finally negotiated, uh, had to be approved by the Senate. That's part of our Constitution. You send the treaty to the U.S. Senate, majority vote, and it becomes the law of the land, an accepted treaty. Jefferson said... These people were so creepy, I'm not even going to submit this treaty to the U.S. Senate. So that ended, dead ended. Slave trade. Let's uh, take a look at some of this. Uh, U.S. slave trade was abolished. Now, slavery wasn't abolished. Just the trading of slaves, bringing them in from Africa, and then having auctions in major cities uh, in the South. Was this a moral decision? No, it wasn't. Uh, it was economic in nature. The reason is the only way to buy a slave now was from a large plantation owner who had too many slaves. This benefited people like Jefferson who were large plantation owners. Jefferson owned 600 slaves. Birthing of slaves became an industry. It was now internal. So it's an economic decision, not a moral one. <clears throat> Jefferson got Congress to pass an act that uh, prohibited the importation of slaves. The act was passed in 1807, but did not take effect until 1808. And again, Jefferson would benefit greatly from this new law. Slave trade, Jefferson's role. Uh, presidents. Uh, talk about legislation that they would like to see passed in the State of the Union message. So they tell Congress, please do this stuff. Uh, Jefferson uh, that year called for an end to the slave trade. Slave trade's immoral, violation of human rights, importation is wrong. Jefferson argued all of this. None of it, of course, applied to slavery itself. Uh, so ending the slave trade, again, tremendous advantage to Jefferson, who could now start selling slaves and be uh, among the very few large plantation owners who could do that. So some states had already prohibited slave trade. Uh, it, it had been allowed under the Articles of Confederation. The United States did not have a constitution at first. It had a, it was a confederation, 1776 to 1789. In 1789, the U.S. Constitution had been written, 1787, adopted in 1789 by two-thirds of the states, and uh, now we're ready to uh, be a separate country. Well, what's it say? Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1. 
the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. So why is all this happening in 1807 and it's gonna become active in 1808? It's because our constitution read that you can import slaves into the US up until the year 808. Then you're gonna to have to renew it <clears throat> or delete it. Jefferson says, let's delete it. So it's interesting, 21st century immigration policies. I mean, think about what we're doing today from 1789 to 1808, anyone was allowed in, uh, including slaves, uh, sometimes with a $10 fee, which is about $200 to $250 today, but frequently such a fee was not collected. So no federal law can prohibit the slave trade until 1808. After 1808, we've stopped the slave trade through the national government. South Carolina says, well, you're not gonna stop it here. Here's South Carolina. So South Carolina takes a stand against federal government and the constitution. So the law gets passed 1807, takes effect on uh, uh, January 1st of 1808. And uh, well, we can, uh, talk a little bit about this slave trade bill, but I don't know, I, uh, do we have uh, do we have many questions or? We have uh, three questions and two comments, so. Well, why that. don't we stop and do and go through that because uh, <clears throat> usually people come in with more items and that's plenty anyway. The first comment is from a viewer that says, your slide said that 22, a uh, 0.67 fold decrease while well, you meant increase. So I get five points. So that's just somebody getting okay. more points, more JB points. I, I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm no good at math. I usually, there's a couple guys in class that do math. And uh, 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 anyway, uh, thanks. That's an increase decrease thing. Usually I... Uh, uh, send all my math problems to somebody else and say, did I do this right? And they always write back and say, no, here's the correct answer. So anyhow, thanks. I'll change that on the slide. Um, next comment is that another bias to the world map is that it's oriented north to south, north having a superior placement. So uh, um, I think that's just a, a comment from a viewer, but well, we can move on to some of the questions. Um, who ran against Jefferson in 1804? Hmm. Off the top of my head, I can't remember. 1800 was John Adams. 1804, now I can see that guy. God. Huh. I don't know. Uh, it's easy thing to look up. I'll look it up for next week. Uh, unless it somebody. Like, it looks like it was Charles Pinckney. From yeah. South Carolina. Charles Pickney. Yep. Okay, good. Um, next question. Which tribe did Pike sign the treaty with? Dakota or the Ojibwe? That would have been the Dakota uh, in that area. Uh, the Ojibwe's were further north. And then our last question that we have currently is how was Louisiana named and by who? We have or, I guess another way to ask that would be what was oh, it named? What was it named? Uh, well, it was uh, a lot of the kings of France were named Louis. Uh, as a matter of fact, when France got rid of the king, the last one was Louis the Sixteenth. So it uh, got named after the king of France. So that's currently all of our questions. If anyone else has any questions, please put them in the Q&A feature and we'll be sure to get to those. 
Oh, well, we went through those quickly. Anyway, uh, uh, hmm. I'm trying to think of something to say here. I, Were there any documents that hinted at what Sally thought about what Jefferson did? Any document? Whoops. Sally Hemings? Yeah, no, there aren't. None that I know of. I don't. She she probably couldn't even read or write. Uh, I'd be pretty surprised <clears throat> if some people hadn't tried to interview her. Uh, but she may have been protective of all of that, and some of her children passed for white. Uh, two or three of them moved to Wisconsin. Uh, and did Jefferson ever make any allusions to um, maybe Sally or his relationship with her in his letters? No, none. Of, nothing I know of. No. Uh, uh, people certainly knew about it. There were lots of comments about a relationship with a slave woman in the diaries of people who knew Jefferson. And uh, they talked about some of the children there on the Jefferson plantation and how white they looked and yet uh, were obviously of African ancestry also. And uh, there were some black children with red hair. Jefferson had red hair. It was pretty obvious to people and in this 1804 election, it was an election issue also. Does Jefferson have a mistress? Uh -oh. All right. Well, that uh, I think that does it for our questions and comments for today. So um, thanks, JB. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll see you all next week.